We all have paradigms and roadblocks that prevent us from excelling, and they can be real or imagined. Welcome to Beyond Bricks, a podcast that will give you the ability to break through those walls. Here's Dr. Nathan Unruh. Welcome to a conversation on the chiropractic journey, where we explore the rich history, present developments, and future prospects of the chiropractic profession. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Andrew, and today we have the privilege of speaking with a true visionary in the field. Joining us is Dr. Carl Cleveland III, an esteemed chiropractor and the driving force behind Cleveland University, Kansas City. With its 100-year-old College of Chiropractic as well as its College of Health Sciences, Dr. Cleveland has dedicated his life to advancing the chiropractic profession and preserving its history. With a deep passion for education and research, he has made significant contributions to the field, ensuring that the future generations of chiropractors have a solid foundation on which to build their careers. Currently serving as the president of Cleveland University, Kansas City, Dr. Cleveland has played an instrumental role in shaping the institution's vision and mission. Cleveland Chiropractic College was founded in 1922 by his grandparents, Dr. Carl Cleveland Sr. and Dr. Ruth Ashworth. Dr. Cleveland III has served the institution for the past 50 years. Under his leadership, the university has become a hub for chiropractic excellence, offering comprehensive programs that empower students to become exceptional practitioners. One aspect that sets Cleveland Chiropractic University apart is its commitment to preserving the history of the profession. Dr. Cleveland firmly believes that understanding our roots is crucial for the growth and evolution of chiropractic. He has spearheaded initiatives to create a repository of chiropractic history within the university, ensuring that the invaluable knowledge and experience of pioneers and trailblazers are never lost. Why is preserving the history of the profession so important? Well, chiropractic has come a long way since its inception. It is through the lessons of the past that we can shape a brighter future. The stories of triumph, innovation, and resilience inspire and guide us, reminding us of the transformative power of chiropractic care. In our conversation today, we will delve into the significant events that have shaped the history of our profession. We'll ask Dr. Cleveland to share his insights and identify the top three events that have had a long lasting impact on chiropractic. From the early struggles to gain recognition, to the milestones that have propelled chiropractic into mainstream healthcare, we'll explore the key moments that have defined our profession. Additionally, we'll discuss the responsibility we all share as chiropractors to maintain the momentum and build the foundation laid by our predecessors. Dr. Cleveland will provide valuable guidance on how we can honor their legacy and continue the progress that has been achieved so far. Dr. Cleveland has graciously accepted our invitation to share his wisdom and experiences with us, and we are truly honored to have him here. So without further ado, let's dive into our conversation with Dr. Carl Cleveland III. Welcome everyone to this conversation. Super excited to be have a gentleman that has been so important for our profession. And thank you so much, Dr. Cleveland, for making this time to have this conversation with me. I know this will impart so much of your wisdom and my hopes is in the hearts and the minds of our listeners so that we can continue this great thing that we call chiropractic for many, many years to come. So your background of being a chiropractor and now the president of an institution that's been around for a hundred years, I think it's appropriate to start the conversation with, tell me about the history of Cleveland. Starts with a case study and young woman named Silva. Silva was a school teacher. She taught at Peru Normal College and uh, just outside of Lincoln, Nebraska. She given birth to all five of her children before she was age 25. And her husband was an itinerant farmer and he went south and never came back and she was a single parent. But Silva had a series of health issues as it was reported in her case history. And uh, some of the symptoms of diabetes, of dropsy, other conditions and any event, her condition progressed so aggressively, the doctors of the day 
uh, it intended to amputate her, her right leg at the knee because of diabetic gangrene. And uh, this, they were prepping her for surgery as the, as the record was, um, was stated. And they came back in and said, Miss Ashworth, we don't think that you'll live six months. We're not sure you'd even survive the surgery. We know you're a single parent. Put your affairs in order, go home, make out your will. You maybe have six months to live. She went home, prepared uh, to arrange for her children to go with relatives. And a, and a woman down the road said, have you ever tried chiropractic? Five word question, have you ever tried chiropractic? She'd never heard the word chiropractic. He's a new doctor in town. He's a graduate from some college over near the Mississippi River. What do you have to lose? She had nothing to lose. She had six months. She goes, she proceeds. The uh, record indicates the chiropractor was named Olson. He was a Palmer graduate. And he proceeded with a series of adjustings uh, in her mid thoracic, in her cervical area. He would adjust her repetitively throughout the day, send her home, bring her back the next day, did that for a series of weeks. And interestingly, the, the gangrenous toes that was attributed to diabetes began to pinken up, began to heal. In fact, over a period of time, the chemistry of diabetes left her. How do you explain that observation? Was it spontaneous remission? Was it misdiagnosis? Well, whatever Silva had, her condition left her and she attributed it to chiropractic. She was so excited about her new life through chiropractic as she then arranged for two of her children to stay with relatives and brought the others to Davenport, Iowa and Silva enrolled in the Palmer School of Chiropractic and she graduated in 1910. Dr. Silva Ashworth was her name. She became the first woman to practice chiropractic in the state of Nebraska. Quite a pioneer, very controversial. First of all, to be a doctor and a woman in 1910, uh, that was very unique. Uh, in addition to that, she created controversy, it was in the Des Moines Register. She would go into the Nebraska State Penitentiary and adjust the prisoners, actually put her hands on the prisoners. Uh, quite scandalous at that time. Her daughter, Ruth, worked as a chiropractic assistant, saw the changes in patient care every day and said, mother, take me to the Palmer School. I wanna be a chiropractor like you. So mother takes Palm, uh, daughter Ruth to the Palmer School, introduces her to B.J. Palmer. Uh, while Ruth is there, Ruth Ashworth, in a class of anatomy, she met a young fellow from Simpson College. He taught mathematics. He was a coach at Simpson College, wanted to be a chiropractor. And they met in that class of anatomy and they courted and they ended up getting married. And in fact, B.J. Palmer gave away the bride. They were married in B.J. Palmer's home. B.J. was the son of the founder of chiropractic. And, and that young man's name was Carl Cleveland. And those were my grandparents. They met at the Palmer School. They started their first chiropractic practice in Webster City, Iowa in 1917. But because my grandfather was an athlete, he wanted to look at the influence of chiropractic care on athletic performance. Back in 1917, 1918, where do you go to find people that are into fitness unless it's at a college or university? Well, they looked at Chicago, they looked at Kansas City, and they chose to move their practice to Kansas City because Kansas City had a very active YMCA. Where did you find people who were into fitness back in, the, in 1917 or 18? YMCA was that opportunity for them. So that brought them to Kansas City and they started their chiropractic practice. And in 1922, with just three students, they founded uh, Central College of Chiropractic, founded as a not-for-profit organization. It remains as such, not-for-profit tax exempt today. And uh, since then, the institution has, has grown to what it is today from three students to today, 633 students with graduates in all 50 states and in, in 20 foreign countries. But to put this in perspective from a historical standpoint, while Cleveland was founded as Central College of Chiropractic in 1922, and it was later renamed Cleveland College of Chiropractic in 1924, the Practice Act that legally defined chiropractic as a licensed health profession did not come about until 1927. The first college, 
Central College of Chiropractic was in a residence. It was in a duplex with a residence upstairs and then a residence downstairs. And the upstairs kitchen was converted to a human dissection lab. The downstairs kitchen was converted to a chemistry lab. The living room was the waiting room for the patients. The dining room is where the patients were treated. Upstairs were converted into classrooms, but that was not only the clinic and the college, it was the home that my grandparents and my father lived in. My father would tell the story of what it was like to live and to grow up in that house. And it was at a time when literally a knock at the door brought fear of arrest. The college was founded in 1922, but it was not until 1927 that the state of Missouri licensed chiropractors as a legal healthcare profession. My father would say that the rule at the house, and, and he was four or five years old then, if there was a knock at the door, he was to remain motionless, not to let out a peep, not a sound, until his parents could peek through the curtains of a window to look to the front door to make a decision. Was this caller a prospective student? Was it a patient seeking care? Or was it an agent sent to arrest them for the illegal practice of medicine without a license? My father would say, I'd get along pretty well through the day at school until we'd be putting the crayons and the tablets away. He said, I break out into a sweat and then I'd run all the way home just to make sure my parents weren't in jail. My grandmother, Ruth Cleveland, would sew coins into the lining of my father's jacket and say, son, if you come home and if the house is locked, go next door, Miss Aletha, she'll take care of you. She'll do your laundry. You can sleep there until we get out of jail. And it's okay, son, rip open the lining to your jacket because each one of those quarters will buy you a full meal at the restaurant at Independence Avenue and Prospect. What was it like to grow up at a time when literally a knock at the door brought fear of arrest? So that's my story. Uh, my grandfather was quite a leader and a spokesperson in chiropractic. He was an activist, as was my grandmother. They would uh, testify in court for chiropractors that were uh, arrested for the illegal practice of medicine without a license. He would arrange for the portable adjusting table. This is my grandfather, C.S. Cleveland, would arrange for the portable adjusting table to be taken into the jail cell. So the patients, they had visiting hours in jail back then in, in the Kansas City area. So patients could come in and actually get their adjustments. Sometimes the jailers would get their adjustments too. My grandfather would arrange for the patients to picket outside of the courthouse chanting, we want our doctor. We want our doctor. My grandfather, Dr. C.S. Cleveland, he would arrange for the brass band to play outside during the trial to bring attention to the fact that someone was being persecuted illegally. So that's our story. Uh, we've now grown to uh, expanded substantially as an institution, now to become a university, Cleveland University, Kansas City, with our College of Chiropractic and also a College of Health Sciences. The College of Health Sciences has an associate's degree in human biology, an associate's degree in radiological technology, in orthopedic, uh, in, in occupational therapy assistance, a bachelor's degree in human biology, a bachelor's degree in exercise science, a master's in health promotion, as well as a master's degree in exercise physiology and sports science. And the focus of the university through its College of Chiropractic and its College of Health Sciences, our mission is health promotion, to be a leader in health promotion education. And when we say health promotion, we're talking about health behaviors that empower people to control their health and to improve their health through lifestyle behaviors. So that's our focus, that's our mission. Yes, we're now over a hundred years old. We celebrated our centennial here this last fall, quite a celebration. And we're well positioned for the next hundred years. And I'm so honored to be here, part of this, uh, this, uh, this presentation here yet today. Awesome, well, I appreciate that story because now I know a whole nother level of why you're so passionate about chiropractic. And this is why I wanted to have this conversation with you, because I think 
so many of us don't understand, appreciate what had to take place in the early years of our profession to be where we are today. The fact that I don't have to worry about going to jail. And and my mom didn't have to sew coins in my suit coat and tell me where to go get a meal. But I think those historical facts has laid the foundation that we can never forget that we have to continue to do our individual and collective work to keep the profession strong and relevant in the healthcare space. I know another one of your passions, Dr. Cleveland, is to make sure that we don't let all these things that have taken place in the past get buried and lost. So there at Cleveland, you are created archives of all of our important documents and documentation of all of our important events. And I thank you for that. And as you listen to this, everybody today, I want you to make sure that think about how you can support that cause, because that's a big undertaking. It costs money, it costs energy, it costs resources, but I think it's time well spent and money well spent. So let me transition into the conversation. I know there's been so many events that have shaped our history. And just because of the time element here, I want to focus on what you feel have been the three key events in the history of chiropractic that have shaped our profession. Well, thank you. The uh, setting aside the licensure of chiropractic, which was obviously significant, the first state being Kansas in 1913, and then the last state to license chiropractors being uh, Louisiana in 1974, setting aside that, that legalized the profession in all 50 states. And there are so many events, but let me focus on what I think um, has really been the substantial influencers so to speak, for this profession. And and I'll speak to them chronologically. At first, I would say would be 1974, when the United States Department of Education approved the Council on Chiropractic Education as the reliable accreditor for chiropractic education. People step back and say, well, why is that significant? Well, for multiple reasons. It meant that the profession's educational system was recognized by the Department of Education like other universities and colleges across the United States. But here's what else made that important. It standardized chiropractic education. In addition to that, it brought federal financial aid for chiropractic students. Prior to 74, students either had to be very wealthy to go to chiropractic college or they had to work part-time or full-time to have the funds to to pay tuition to go to chiropractic college. So that substantially impacted. And today, I would estimate, I know from our our own institution, over 90% of the students enrolled have some form of federal financial aid that allows them to go to school, to have living expenses, uh, and to sustain this program that's uh, four academic years after the pre-professional health sciences. In addition to that, the Council on Chiropractic Education is significant because it brought the educational community in chiropractic together initially twice a year. Brought Before the approval by the Department of Education, there were actually two accrediting agencies. One was a branch of the American Chiropractic Association. That was the Council on Chiropractic Education. And the other one was a committee or a branch of the International Chiropractors Association. And um, they didn't always play well. They had different approaches to scopes of practice. But ultimately, when the Council on Chiropractic Education was recognized, that meant all of chiropractic education had to come together and to meet the standards of that body. And that accreditation allowed for fluidity of a graduate from one college that's accredited from the Council on Chiropractic Education to go to any of 50 states. And that opened up a tremendous opportunity 
without a doubt. But as the chiropractic colleges were forced together to meet in a hotel during the accreditation uh, activities, we got to be friends. And those individuals uh, in the one camp of the ACA or one camp of the ICA, those colleges had some of the same challenges that, uh, that, that we did. And as we became friends and there became the element of collegiality, that in itself is a historical outcome of the accreditation of the Council on Chiropractic Education. In fact, the coming together of the colleges each year is what fostered today's association of chiropractic colleges, which is a tremendous influence and has influence in Washington, D.C. for chiropractic education. So I'd say uh, one of the first would be the uh, historical events that shaped the profession was the accreditation. Second, obviously. Okay. So let me let me let me pause you, Dr. Cleveland, there, because I don't want the listeners to miss something that you said there before you get to the, the second thing. We are stronger together than we are individually. So as you met in those hotel rooms, you understood we have more like than we're, than, we're, than we're different. Let's focus on that. That helps create momentum because we're stronger together. So we can't forget that point as we move forward. So I think that was a key point. I didn't want the listeners to miss that you said. Okay, so number two, what's well, the second one? Now that you raised that, Dr. Nathan, let me add another element, a more personal element. You see, in my family, my great grandmother was a chiropractor, my grandmother was a chiropractor, my mother was a chiropractor, my father was a chiropractor. Uh, and when we and but interestingly, my great grandmother and my grandmother, Ruth Cleveland, were active in what was called the National Chiropractic Association, which is today's American Chiropractic Association. But my grandfather, Dr. C.S. Cleveland Sr., and my father and mother, both chiropractors, were active in the International Chiropractors Association. I'd go to a family event, a Thanksgiving dinner, we couldn't get past the salads and they'd be talking about the personalities in the ACA and the ICA. And so I grew up hearing both sides of the debate. And, uh, but interestingly, when it came time for me to be adjusted through that holiday weekend, they would adjust me the same way, they would palpate. So I saw the similarities. And when I came into leadership uh, here at this institution, one of the first things I did was to, uh, to foster a student ACA, and a student ICA. And I would invite the leaders of both groups to uh, come on campus and to have a joint ACA ICA day. And I, in fact, I don't know what the other college leadership uh, does with this, but I enroll at my own cost, uh, the memberships, the student memberships of students in the ACA and the student ICA. And if they elect in the Student American Black Chiropractors Association, why? Because I want them to be informed about the issues. I want them to see the common denominators. I want them to become activists and, and, and this working for us. I love it. Beautiful. I love it. So, so what's the second? What's the second event? I would have to say it was the Wilk case. Uh, filed in uh, 76, uh, ultimately resolved in 1987. Your listeners probably are aware of what the Wilk case is, but five plaintiffs, Chester Wilk, James uh, Lumden, Lumden um, uh, Mike Pettigo, James Bryden, uh, uh, Arthur, uh, came together, filed a lawsuit, uh, working with the attorney, George McAndrews. George McAndrews himself uh, grew up in a chiropractic family, and that's a story in its own right. And I suggest that your, your viewers get a copy of the book by Howard Wilinski, Contain and Eliminate, because there's a story there that needs to be told and retold. We must never forget the struggle and the sweat and the sacrifice that our pioneers went through and what George McAndrews did and what the plaintiffs for the Wilt case did. But the issue, and I'll summarize quickly, was there are laws in this country that uh, are antitrust laws, sometimes reference restraint of trade laws. And the intent of the antitrust laws is that a product or a service could freely be tested in the marketplace, can compete in the marketplace without an overall boycott that impedes the access of that product to the consumer. How does that relate to chiropractic? Organized medicine controlled healthcare. 
still has an influence in healthcare today, obviously. But organized medicine, going back to 1963, established a committee on quackery. And its sole objective was to contain and eliminate the profession of chiropractic. Personal story. This was my senior year. It was in November. I remember it well. And I was uh, at my grandmother's home on my mother's side. And um, the I can remember a name called Walter Cronkite. Some of your senior uh, listeners will know who Walter Cronkite was. One of the most respected uh, broadcasters, radio and on TV, uh, CBS, came on the nightly news. This is when television was black and white. Wasn't paying a lot of attention until I heard the word chiropractic. And his comment was today at the Chicago offices of the American Medical Association, they established their committee on quackery with the sole objective to contain and to eliminate the profession of chiropractic. Now, what's going through my mind? I'm a senior in a high school, and I'm hearing this very authoritative voice come on and say they want to eliminate and contain what my family stands for, for generations, I couldn't wait to get home to ask my father what that was about. And interestingly, he was um, a member of the uh, board of directors of the International Chiropractors Association. And actually he had a heads up. Uh, they had uh, contact to news sources and he said, yes, we knew that was coming. And he explained that to me. And I generally understood it, but I didn't understand it then to the extent that I understand it now. Well, that was 63. And there, and yes, they attempted to contain and eliminate chiropractic. They would uh, influence what it was published in, in textbooks about chiropractic. They would try to influence uh, what uh, was uh, freshman medical students understood to be chiropractic. Let me speak to a personal story. Um, I, after I graduated from the University of Missouri at Kansas City in 1970, uh, I was also a graduate student at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, but also jointly enrolled at the University of Kansas in their School of Medicine. I wasn't pursuing medicine, but I was pursuing uh, a degree in, um, in, in neuroanatomy because of my interest in neuroanatomy and, and how it's so fundamental to the core principles of chiropractic. And I can remember this one morning uh, coming into class, med students surrounding me. I'm, again, I'm in the department of anatomy, but the med students are taking the same anatomy courses that, that I was taking. It was part of their basic sciences. And I can see on the board, the Kansas Medical Society uh, invites all students for lunch and a visit with the members of the Kansas Medical Society. Well, I was hungry and I was one of the students. And so I said, so I, I attended, I stayed there after class. And the focus of that message was the Kansas, this would have been 1972. The focus of that lunch was the Kansas Medical Society handed out a little booklet. And the title of the booklet was Chiropractic, the unscientific cult. And they spent that 30 or 40 minutes indoctrinating those students, medical students, that chiropractic was hazardous to health. It was fraud, it was cultus, it was quackery. And we want you to be informed because your patients may be going to doctors of chiropractic. They didn't refer us to doctors of chiropractic. After that was over, I went up to our uh, director of the program, the Department of Anatomy. So can't we bring in uh, a chiropractor to speak to uh, what chiropractic is and where it fits and kind of balance this out? And I can remember, and I won't mention his name, but he looked at me and he pointed to me. He said, if you have any evidence that the outcome of chiropractic care has any validity at all, you share it with me. And I may then consider bringing in a doctor of chiropractic. Well, this was 1971. We had satisfied patients. Uh, we just soon after that were put into Medicare, but we didn't have the research that we have now. So um, why was Wilk important? Filed in 76, ultimately resolved in 1987, is that 
it leveled the playing field where doctors of medicine could accept referrals from doctors of chiropractic, could refer to doctors of chiropractic, could actually teach at chiropractic colleges and chiropractors could participate in research. And clearly stating that uh, it was ethical for a medical practitioner in their own opinion and choice to elect to voluntarily associate with a doctor of chiropractic. That was a step forward. Why was that significant? Well, if you then look at the 19, early 1990s, and this is a subset of, of a historical significant uh, activity that's attributed to the victory of Wilk versus the AMA, is you had a groundswell of research from 1992 to 1994 that pointed to the effectiveness of, and safety of chiropractic care. You had the RAND Corporation out of Santa Monica. You had the uh, Mead study out of Great Britain. You had the Manga report out of Ontario, Ontario, Canada. And then you had our own Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research in 1994. Why was that significant? Interestingly, when those, when the when the results and the, and the publications are related to those guidelines called for the inclusion of spinal manipulative therapy in the management of back pain. As they stated, largely it's done in America by doctors of chiropractic. I would get calls from the local medical community and the press wanting to say, well, now that there are these new guidelines, help, help us understand when we should refer a patient to a doctor of chiropractic and what will the nature of that care be. So in other words, if it weren't for Wilk having leveled that playing field, I think it would have been years later before that type of research could ever have been done in a cooperative setting. And if you look back, what has really driven this profession forward is research. Research brings credibility. Credibility brings awareness. That awareness brings increased utilization. And look at where we are today. Uh, today, so let me stop with that for just a second. I would say the second element represents the, um, the Wilk case and the victory there. The third dynamic, which is a current dynamic. And as, as, we, as we record the history of chiropractic, I think others will look back and say, yeah, I agree is the tragedy of the addiction to prescribed painkillers. Guidelines from the American College of Physicians, the PAGE study in the American Medical Association, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, even the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals, their guidelines call for, for pain management, first look to non-pharmacological approaches non-drug approaches, and they list massage, acupuncture, chiropractic, spinal manipulation. And even as a result of that, I have had, and, and many of my colleagues in chiropractic education, I've had members of the, of the medical community asking the questions, how in fact can we engage your graduates or doctors of chiropractic to come be part of uh, a first line of fence to drug management given these guidelines? So I would have to point to the tragedy of, of the addiction that will historically be recorded as something that created a wake up call for this profession without a doubt. Oh, we could add so many more. If it wasn't for Wilk, we wouldn't be in the Department of Defense. Uh, in 2000, uh, Clinton signed into um, law that chiropractic be uh, made available to the active military. You had Bush in 2002 uh, mandate that chiropractic be available to veterans. So when you think this through, I would say Wilk case without a doubt has had a tremendous impact that, and then as a result, a cascade of other effects that uh, have influenced our profession today and the patients we serve. I love it. So, okay, you, you gave us three. I mean, and, and I think so many people, Dr. Cleveland, that have been practicing in chiropractic don't understand the magnitude of those events. And I know for me, um, I've been a chiropractor for 24 years, almost 25 years. 
And when I went and read the book Contain and Eliminate, I got fired up. I, I got inspired about and very proud of what I do, but it also motivated me to be that much better. And how do I invest back into this profession for the generations to come? So I encourage as you listen to Dr. Cleveland today, ladies and gentlemen, do take the time to go read about our roots, to, to learn about the history. And then what can you do to help continue this profession forward? We have such a tendency to, to you know, suck on our thumbs, if you will, and complain about insurance companies or complain about this or complain about that. But if we take a moment and take a step back and really say, boy, I am so grateful for those people that came before us. Now, what can we do to continue to take it forward? So that's where I want to end this conversation today, Dr. Cleveland. How do we, how do we support you and what you're doing at Cleveland to, to really preserve this history? And in addition to, for those people who are like, you know what, I want to know more about our history. Where would you point them? Well, I think, first of all, become a member of the Association for the History of Chiropractic. Uh, you'll get the monthly bulletins. You'll have access to the information uh, about the history of the profession. And we're creating the history of profession uh, as we move forward here. Uh, why am I so passionate about this? Uh, so oftentimes, people will say, well, Carl, what was it like growing up surrounded by a family of chiropractors? And I often say, well, we really didn't take vacations. We went to chiropractic conventions and we may have stopped at the Grand Canyon along the way. And um, people said, well, did you always want to be a chiropractor? Well, no, that was not my intent. I wanted to be, uh, first of all, a herpetologist. That's somebody that collects snakes, lizards, and, and, and amphibians. And I wanted to be a, pan, a pianist. And that's how I worked my way through college, playing piano. And uh, I got to be about uh, just before my 20th birthday, playing in a nice supper club here. And they smoked back then in, in, in restaurants. I got to thinking, you know, I don't want to be 30 years old playing in a smoky restaurant. And there wasn't a big market for someone that collected snakes, lizards, and turtles. So I had a biology degree and I thought, well, maybe what mom and dad and my grandparents did, maybe chiropractic would be a good uh, first step, but I want to go into practice. I don't want to go into teaching and administration, but, but, but plans change. But you see, growing up as a son and of, uh, in a chiropractic family, I can remember uh, realizing that our approach to healthcare was different. Uh, it was on a Saturday morning, spring day. And on Saturdays, we'd play softball with the kids in the neighborhood. And I can remember going up, sitting on a step. Her name was Phyllis Johnson. She was in my class, but she was about nine inches taller than I was, had freckles all over her body, stringy reddish blonde hair. Uh, and uh, I thought she was beautiful. And uh, we would play softball with the kids in the neighborhood. And I had a mitt, she had a ball in the bat. And I was waiting for her before we would uh, link up with our friends to play the game. And she came in this one day and she plopped down on the cement stairs in her driveway and said, Carl, my father says, your father's bad. My father says that your father's a quack. I didn't understand the context of quack in that context. And it wasn't for very long. And you know how children will taunt one another, even your friends. I'd be up to bat and they'd be, and I'd be ready to swing. And they'd say, go quack to see, go quack to see. Quack to see was my, my nickname. And I heard that from my friends as, as they would uh, tease me or want to get me upset because they were criticizing what my parents and my family stood for. And uh, interestingly, I went to my 50th reunion here about uh, nine or 10 years back, and I was so eager to find Phyllis. And, and I don't know if you 
too young to have been to a 50th reunion, but you go to the event and there's a registration table and I introduced myself. And of course, I'm looking for Phyllis Johnson. Has Phyllis Johnson come here yet? And I was looking for Bobby Zajic and Ovi Glenn, my buddies that called me quack. And, and I didn't see them registered there. And I went into the room and I, my wife, Elizabeth, I said, here, sit down. Uh, I'll want to work the crowd and I'll be back with you. And I met all of my friends and I looked for Bobby Zajic and I looked for Ovi Glenn and I looked for Phyllis Johnson and they weren't there. And I was disappointed because if Bobby Zajic had been in that room, I would have gone up to Bobby and I would have shaken his hand and I said, Bobby, thank you for calling me Quactor C. If Phyllis had been in that room, I would have gone up to Phyllis I would have given her the biggest hug and say, Phyllis, thank you for calling my father a quack. I would thank them all for lighting the fire in my belly to do all I can to bring the image of this profession into the reality of today's chiropractic care. People say, Carl, what's your why? My why is that every American know, understand, and respect chiropractic services and chiropractic care. And we've come a long way. Gallup, last time I looked, said 14% of the population had seen doctors of chiropractic. For me, that means 86% of the population does not yet know the benefits of our care. So why is history so important? Einstein, many, many things he said, he said, as you climb the mountain of life, it's important that you look back to the village from where you have come, because this profession called chiropractic and it's chiropractic institutions. It's a miracle in face of all of the opposition this profession has had. All of the adverse PR and the name calling and all of the obstacles. Uh, it's amazing how far this profession has come. It, we have come from a time when a knock at the door brought fear of arrest to today walking through the doorways of the Veterans Administration and the Department of, of Defense. Uh, and, and those pioneers, those pioneers lit a torch. They passed that torch to the next generation. And the next generation's responsibility is to go forth and to sustain that flame. And one of many goals I have for this institution and for this profession is that Cleveland become a, a repository for all things historical of chiropractic and that we digitize this and that we make it freely available to anyone who wants to research the history because this story needs to be told over and over again. And especially this younger generation in chiropractic, they need to know the struggle and the sacrifice and the sweat of these pioneers that kept this profession alive. I love it. I love it. And you know what? You've uh, lit a fire in my belly, and I hope that the listeners, the same thing is happening to you right now. So I want to encourage you to get involved. Dr. Cleveland, I can't thank you enough, first and foremost, for this time together. This is so valuable. And just everything that you have done to continue to help our profession and, and what your family has done. I learned every day. I haven't talked to you a whole lot, but every time I do, I'm just fascinated about your knowledge and your wisdom and the experiences that you have had. And I'm so, so grateful for you and, and everything you do. So thanks. Thank you. Again, thanks again for uh, taking this time. My pleasure. Thank you.